welcome everybody to this crucial talk on keeping our humanity. It is part of a week of neighbors, a digital summit within the initiative A World of Neighbors. And my name is Antje Jakelen. I am the Archbishop of the Church of Sweden. And my guest today is none less than the Executive Director of Frontex, the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, Mr. Fabrice Legieri. Am I saying that right? Yes, it's, it's absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us and, and welcome, Mr. Legieri. So in the next around 45 minutes, we will talk about the challenges in Frontex mission to European borders, as well as European commitments to upholding a strong human rights standard. And I will also ask, provokingly so maybe, whether there is or can be a common agenda for Frontex and European civil society. Uh, Mr. Legere, uh, our audience today is rather mixed, international, interfaith, many practitioners and representatives of faith-based organizations. And you and I have not met before and neither might our listeners have met you. So my first question is, who is Fabrice Legere? Tell us a little bit about your background. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon to all um, participants in the, in the audience. Well, uh, I was appointed executive director of Frontex uh, in 2015. Um, this was uh, at that time a very small agency. It was before the uh, crisis, the migration and asylum crisis that broke out in Greece in 2015, 2016. And now, uh, since 2016, we are the European Border and Coast Guard Agency. When it comes to my personal background, um, I have a background in, um, well, uh, Minister of Home Affairs. Um, I was, uh, um, I've been working for several years in, in uh, the French Minister of uh, Home Affairs, uh, dealing with the Schengen um, area, and in particular, the, the, the development at the very beginning of the Schengen area in the late 90s and, and 2000s, uh, then I was in the European Commission, uh, working there, uh, let's say, to, to develop the Schengen area. Um, and then uh, I had also a background in uh, uh, the Ministry of uh, Defense, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, so let's say uh, Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and European Commission. And now since 2015, uh, Frontex, uh, which uh, is now bigger, much bigger than it was uh, seven, eight years ago. Uh, when it comes to my own uh, education, I'm a, a civil servant. Uh, I'm not a, a police officer. I'm not a soldier. I'm not a, a military officer. I'm, uh, I have a civilian status, a civilian background, uh, let's say in uh, administration um, management. Uh, so that's my, my background. Uh, if you wish to know more, of course, feel free to ask. Well, thank you so much. Uh, well, certainly today, many of us are very concerned about the developments uh, in and around the Ukraine. Uh, what do from your horizon what do you see will happen and how do you prepare well uh i was also late to confess everything because I, i'm getting out of a, a meeting about ukraine uh because uh, well uh of course we we are not um, competent for the uh, military or, or security uh developments um, depending on what russia will do but if there is, uh, let's say, a military um, aggression uh, or uh, some developments that would uh, displace more people uh, from Ukraine to uh, the European Union. Uh, we are working uh, on contingency planning in order to, to help um, member states of the European Union and the EU institutions to, to channel uh, the, the flows. What I mean here is that if there is uh, a war uh, in Ukraine, uh, there will be people fleeing, uh, very likely there, there will be people fleeing Ukraine, 
uh, and this would be people in need of international protection. So we are not in such a scenario. We are not in a, in a scenario um, considering uh, irregular uh, migration, but we are in a, in a fully fledged, let's say, refugee uh, scenario, which means that our role would be to, to support um, our member states. So we have four uh, member states neighboring uh, Ukraine. So we have Poland, we have Slovakia, Hungary and Romania. And the role would be to support those member states to um, fingerprint, to register uh, the people, um, also to carry out some border surveillance, uh, to contribute to security screening. Perhaps also there would be a need to know uh, if there are not other people who are not, um, let's say, fleeing Ukraine, but other people trying to, to be mingled in those flows, that could be uh, potentially a security threat. We never know when, when people are coming from a, a battlefield. But this would be in the, in the worst case scenario, which uh, is for the time being uh, not, um, not the case. But uh, of course, the situation is... Uh, worse than uh, it was 24 hours ago. Mm. Uh, so uh, you are, in a sense, preparing for different kind of scenarios. You are speaking about the, uh, to channel the flows, security risks. Um, do you see an uphill journey to uh, have countries within the European Union uh, be welcoming to these people to these human beings? My impression when I, I listen to member states, um, my impression is that there is a, um, a broad understanding that uh, if there is a war uh, in a neighboring country, so neighboring the EU, um, we have a duty to, to protect them, maybe temporary. So I, I don't know exactly. Um, well, Frontex is not in charge of asylum policy. So whether it should be temporary protection, whether it should be fully fledged refugee status, I don't know. I'm not competent for that. But at least um, I can hear um, understanding that, uh, yes, we, the European Union would have to, to, to protect those people. I can even hear uh, that in some member states, they consider that this could be a good opportunity to have manpower um, that is, um, let's say, educated, that could easily be integrated in, in, uh, in, in societies uh, here in the European Union. So that's, um, at first glance, my impression today. Of course, in our audience, there are many people who Thing have become more and more concerned about issues of fortress Europe and not thinking that our track record in dealing with these questions is actually a very good one. So they might be very concerned about how, how things are working together. I mean, of course, Frontex has the task of Frontex and other several tasks, but still, if we are trying to keep our humanity, there is an urge to bring these agencies, these forces, these strengths together in the service of, of humanity. By the way, what is home for you? Home? Uh, well, it's the European Union. <laughs> now, but I mean, I, I was born in France. Um, I live uh, now, I've been living in Warsaw for uh, the last seven years, uh, sharing my life between um, Poland, uh, France, Belgium, and, and, and Germany in, in the last years. So that's why I'm saying it's, it's the European Union. I really feel uh, European, uh, but maybe coming back to this uh, notion of Fortress Europe, um, I would like to, to clarify uh, the role of uh, Frontex as European Border and Coast Guard Agency is to, to, to contribute to well-functioning external borders of the European Union. And the reason for that is that uh, the European Union wants to have the Schengen area, so the so-called European area of freedom, security and justice, which means uh, no border checks between the member states. And we all suffered during the pandemic when suddenly uh, overnight uh, national border checks were reintroduced um, for sanitary reasons. This was legally correct, but in practice, we could see that in fact, uh, our home uh, or our normal environment is to have this free movement in Europe. So in order to have this in place and, and, and properly functioning, 
Member states um, want to have uh, the assurance that they can trust the, the functioning of the external borders, which means that Frontex was created to, to be the operational uh, arm, the operational solidarity of the European Union towards member states that would need uh, support. Um, and, and then the question, of course, and this is a question relevant uh, in this context today about uh, humanity and about uh, how to, 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 to keep our, our uh, uh, humanity, uh, I think the problem, uh, I'm not talking about Ukraine, but I'm talking about other places where um, there is no clear evidence that there is a conflict uh, and we have, because there is no, let's say, coordinated, uh, agreed uh, European policy uh, uh, on asylum, um, there is a there are mixed flows of people uh, trying to cross uh, illegally. And then uh, part of them are, let's say, really uh, and sincerely in need of protection. So this was the case, for example, of the Syrian people coming from, from Syria uh, because of the war. But there are other people who, let's say, are looking for a better life uh, for economic reason. And of course, this is, uh, Everybody can understand that, um, but we we don't have in the European Union um, proper uh, legal uh, or proper policy. It's more a, a lack of policy than a lack of a legal system. It's a lack of a, of a policy on uh, asylum and uh, orderly um, moves uh, movement of uh, of uh, legal migrants, and because of that. Um, there was an impact, uh, in particular in 2015-16, um, the, at the external border of the European Union, when 1.2 million uh, people uh, crossed the border uh, illegally, which creates, of course, uh, also security concerns. So because of all this, there is the perception um, that there is a fortress Europe. But what I used to say, and I'm, I'm really uh, keen on saying, uh, the role of Frontex is to make the free movement, the European free movement possible. And that's why we have to support the member states. But I'm aware that because there is no asylum policy, because there is no legal migration policy, then it's very difficult for, for everybody. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought of yourself as a migrant? Um, well, I had, uh, well, you know, I have an Italian name. So uh, in, the, in the 19th century, uh, I had some ancestors uh, who moved from the northern part of Italy to a territory that at that, part, at that time was part of Germany and then became part of France. So uh, I'm, I'm not, um, let's say that it, when it comes to, to, to the identity, I know that uh, it's possible to, to have, um, let's say, multi I would not say multi, multiple identity, but at least that uh, the, the narrative is not uh, so straightforward and that there can be uh, uh, history, personal uh, background that can mingle different, different cultural uh, inputs. So, well, I, yeah, I myself am considered an immigrant in, in Sweden. Uh, but I also identify as deeply European. So I think the, the idea that we can have hybrid identities is very clear to us as Europeans. And maybe we sometimes forget how privileged that, that is, that we can do that. Uh, you being in, 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 in Warsaw, uh, we of course hear reports from what is going on at the border between Poland and Belarus, uh, that protection seekers freeze to death and die of hunger. Uh, and that it has been declared a restricted military zone, that journalists and aid workers are not allowed to enter and so on. How would you assess your ability to fulfill the strategic objective of safe, secure and well-functioning EU borders at our borders to Belarus? I think what, what is um, now a new development, um, it started in 2020 uh, between Turkey and Greece, and, and then it, it uh, reiterated again um, at the border between Belarus and uh, Poland, Belarus, Lithuania, Belarus, uh, Latvia. This is the use of, um, let's say, irregular migrants, the use of migrants as uh, some sort of 
geopolitical uh, weapon or leverage. So instrumentalization of migrants by state-sponsored um, uh, organization uh, or even the state, uh, neighboring state, claiming that they are using migrants to, um, to put pressure on the European Union for political reasons. They started in 2020 with uh, Turkey, saying that uh, 100 uh, or 200,000 uh, migrants would uh, move from Turkey to, to the EU, so mostly to Greece, because um, Turkish authorities said, now we are opening the border. And this was, was to put pressure on the EU, let's say, in a negotiation, um, among other topics, uh, it was about the, the budget that the EU uh, had to pay to Turkey in order to, to alleviate the burden of the, 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 the refugees in, in Turkey. What is true is that there are four people refugees there, so this costs a lot of money, but there were other, other more geopolitical issues. That was the first time. And then coming back to, to the situation in Poland and, and coming back to Belarus, this was claimed that uh, the Belarusian uh, regime, so Lukashenko, uh, organized um, the, 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 the transport of uh, migrants from uh, different countries, from Iraq, from African countries, to, to come to Minsk. Um, the official reason was tourism or a vaccination scheme, COVID vaccination scheme. But in reality, uh, then they were transported to the, the external border of the EU, so to, Lith to the Lithuanian or Polish or Latvian border. And then there, there were some um, violent actions, uh, at least a uh, use of force, pushing the, the, the migrants uh, into the EU territory. Now, the question in, in front of this um, is that it, it's really, it, it's, a, it's a situation that is not written in the books. Um, of course, I, I, I assume that, uh, Madam Archbishop, you, you, you would say, well, we have to, to support uh, uh, everyone and, and we have to, to of course, uh, welcome them without um, asking any question whether they were pushed by, um, let's say, hostile uh, neighboring country, in this case, uh, Belarus. But for, for states, for member states, also for the EU institutions, um, they developed then the, the, the concept of um, hybrid threat. Um, which is, uh, I don't have the, the proper answer and I don't have the, I, I'm not sure anybody has the proper answer uh, in political terms, what to do. But this is really a lack of respect for, for person. This is definitely not um, uh, in line with the, with the humanity that people are misused. And then the reaction of some member states was uh, to, to, to protect their borders. Frontex was not um, requested by Poland to, to intervene in, uh, at the border between Poland and, and Belarus, so we are not deployed uh, there. We were deployed um, since, we are deployed since July in Lithuania, because Lithuania requested our support. There, there was uh, less confrontation, uh, less use of force. Between Poland and Belarus, it was really, it looked like a military confrontation, soldiers on, on both sides, uniformed people uh, shooting in the air, but uh, a very volatile situation. Between Lithuania and Belarus, it was different. Um, but of course, I'm aware that uh, there were casualties, people uh, dying at the, at the border between, between Belarus and, and Poland. And this is, of course, something that is appalling that, that, that this, uh, this happened. Well, how does this kind of refusal from a member state, like in the case of Poland, affect your ability to, to fulfill your task? Well, uh, we, we could, I, I have to say that, um, well, normally uh, we, we propose our support or we are requested to, to, to support a member state. So Lithuania, for example, requested the so-called rapid border intervention, which is a, a crisis mechanism that we activated. Um, Poland did not request. Um, I was in touch with Polish authorities about all this. Um, this was in uh, September, October, when, when the crisis was really, uh, and then it, it, it became even worse in November, December. Um, but um, I must say also that it, in, in the light of the, 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 the use of force and the, the, the level of, of tension, even military tension there, um, 
I'm not sure that this would be the right place for a civilian uh, border uh, agency, European border agency like Frontex. And perhaps one, one more element is that um, now we have the European Standing Corps with the European blue uniform, the, the, the uniform of the European Union. Um, we have um, border guards now uh, more and more also equipped like um, police force, uh, so including with handguns. So in the context of this geopolitical confrontation between the EU and, and Belarus, um, one of my fear is that if we show up in such a, a violent context, I mean, the, the, the border between Poland and, 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 and Belarus, as, as the situation was so violent uh, so, some weeks ago, um, we might become a political target. Uh, of course, I have a duty of care towards the staff, but beyond that, uh, well, this duty of care is, of course, the same concern as, uh, as other um, as, as member states. But the political target, meaning that if we show up with the European Union uniform, if we are in a context of hybrid threat, my guess is it, it would be tempting for the neighboring third country just to play the game and to, to try what's going to happen because we represent them the European Union. And, and this is where um, maybe we need some uh, more political integration in the European Union. Uh, we are not a federal state. I'm not saying that we should have a federal state. We are the European Union as it is. But um, let's say that uh, in, in a member state, um, in a national state or in um, if we compare, for example, with the United States, well, this is a federal uh, state. So if there is any issue like this at the border, there is a federal government in the US saying, this is the way forward. This is what we have to do or, or not to accept. And then there, there would be a clear geopolitical guidance because we are only a, an operational agency. We are not politicians. In the case of the European Union, you understand probably it would be much more complex in terms of geopolitical guidance in order to avoid that our um, women and men uh, in European uniform become a political geopolitical target. Mr. Leger, if I may, what keeps you awake at night? I think uh, we all work a lot uh, during during the days. Um, I have to say that uh, this is also what I, I, I tell uh, our uh, our colleagues that uh, we also have to 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 be uh, to 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 have some rest. Uh, what keep me um, well? I, 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 we have to work a lot now um, on different fronts. We have to work on the um, development of the, the European Standing Corps, which is still uh, something in, in development. Uh, we are, in the meantime, we have different crises. Um, so we have this uh, Ukrainian crisis, which is now developing. We have the Belarusian crisis, which is not over. Um, so we, we have um, a lot of areas where um, we see that um, there are um, situations that um, could be um, could raise um, or could lead to to crisis. Crisis. Does that pose any ethical dilemma to you? Well, the, the ethical dilemmas you see. Well, the ethical di dilemma um, is is that um, well, we we have uh, the mandate to to be of course a uh, border guard agency while fully uh, complying with the fundamental rights uh, for example i can uh, i explained to you a little bit the the, the dilemma uh, the political but this is then also an ethical dilemma uh, the extension of this political dilemma geopolitical di dilemma with the the, the belarusian case uh, becomes of course an ethical dilemma uh, if we have people freezing uh, in the in the border between uh, Belarus and, and, and Poland. This is an example, but I can give you another example which is not related to a geopolitical situation, but this is the, the, the action of the criminal networks. And for example, in the central Mediterranean, we know that uh, this is unfortunately uh, a very good um, business for criminal organizations to, to put migrants' uh, lives at risk 
and and in particular uh, well from libya uh, they are they are people who are on 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 boats which of on dinghies which uh, are not seaworthy and this is clear that uh, migrants um, cannot reach the the the, the european union uh, on these dinghies so what we do is of that we contribute uh, to um, search and rescue in the in the central med. There are um, well different uh, planes operating, um, and and in line with the uh, law of the sea. Um, so we, we we cooperate with uh, coastal states and and with the um, with the, the in particular the member states of the European Union. Um, but there are also uh, situations where uh, the, 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 the migrants uh, unfortunately die. There are many people dying at sea. Frontex uh, rescued in the last five years, five, six years, 350,000 lives, mostly in the Mediterranean. So the ethical situation is, the ethical dilemma, let's say, uh, is if, um, Let's imagine uh, that there would be a huge uh, search and rescue uh, mechanism in the central Mediterranean. Um, then this might um, beef up uh, the uh, flows that would uh, then be uh, used by criminal organizations to, to charge migrants and to promise them uh, a lot of things, which of course uh, are not true. Uh, and, and then more people would put their life at risk, uh, not only in the Mediterranean, but uh, some of them uh, put their life at risk in the in the Sahel region, because there are also many people crossing the, the, the Sahel region. So the dilemma here is um, we have to, to combine um, the fight against um, cross-border crime, because they are criminal organizations uh, that should be uh, combated uh, without any hesitation. It's not easy because they are not in the European Union. They may have other uh, partner or criminal organizations uh, located in the European Union. So this is where, together with the member states, together with Europol, we have to, to, to fight against, the, to crack down the criminal uh, business. So that's one part of the equation, if I may say. Another part is that we have, of course, to, to develop search and rescue capacities and the ability to save lives. But we, we should not... Um, make it easier for criminal organizations. So that's the, the ethical, uh, let's say it's an operational problem, but it's, it's of course an ethical problem. And, and this is something that um, at least since 2017, uh, I became fully aware of the situation. It has not been solved. Mm. Uh, yes, of course. And, and uh, if you say, well, if you rescue this beefs up the flows, uh, this is very drastic. Uh, there's some truth to it, but on the other hand, as, as, as I know, many practitioners say that, uh, well, the choice to, to, to get on a dinghy is still a choice that you make, knowing that the alternative is still worse. Um, so, um, and also in this, during this week of, of neighbors, several times the term of uh, Crimigration has been used. You may be familiar with it, this, uh, the fusion of criminal and immigration law, which can lead to a criminalization of immigration as such. And that leads me to, to ask you, what kind of training do you, does your staff get when it comes to uh, human rights, uh, about keeping our humanity uh, over against fighting criminal networks? I can imagine a situation when I, when I deployed and my former goal is to fight criminalization, I say, see criminals everywhere. Uh, so what kind of training for, for human rights and humanitarian standards does your staff get? Somebody told me, I don't know whether it's right or wrong, that in, from the beginning of Frontex, there was more training in this than it is now. No, I think this is uh, this is not correct because, uh, on the contrary, uh, we have more fundamental rights. Um, let's say uh, policy. Um, the the reason for that is that uh, now we have the European Standing Corps, which is partially our own staff. So for the first time in the European Standing Corps, we have EU public agents 
wearing the, the European uniform. So they are Frontex staff. They have a contract of employment with Frontex. So we really have to, to, to train them even more. Uh, we also have to train uh, the, the national border guards, which are deployed under, under Frontex operations. What we have in place is, uh, first we have a fundamental rights officer who is an independent authority within uh, Frontex. Uh, they are fundamental rights monitors. This is new. Uh, since uh, we have now the standing core, we have also monitors deployed uh, in the field and they monitor uh, the compliance uh, with fundamental rights uh, in, the, in the field. So really at the external borders, not uh, from the headquarters in, in Warsaw, but really field work, if I, if I may say. Uh, the training uh, is, um, is from the very beginning uh, embedded in the, in the overall training of, uh, of border guards. I mean, uh, now if I talk about our new recruits, and, and for example, we have since the uh, beginning of January this year, we have 150 cadets that uh, were recruited. They will uh, be uh, trained in 2022. 20, uh, so that this is a 12 month training uh, and the uh, modules on fundamental rights are uh, completely uh, part of the overall training. So they have modules on uh, implementation of the Schengen border code. So the, the, the procedure on how to check people in the border crossing point. Uh, how to use, uh, let's say, a database in, in the field of security, how to, to use uh, firearms, because they are trained for that. And, and we are very strict on the compliance with certain number of standards, technical standards to be trained, um, psychological assessment, training also in, uh, to be uh, able to, to have proportionate uh, approach, proportionate assessment of the situation. So that, for example, uh, if there is a boat, let's keep, let's give an example. If there is a, a boat where uh, we see that there are some, some criminals um, even using uh, firearms in order to threaten the, the, the Coast Guard officers, but on the same boat, they are civilians and, and they are migrants, uh, men, women, vulnerable person, children, etc. Of course, the reasonable and, and proportionate use of force in, in such a case is not to start shooting because uh, the risk of having casualties uh, among the migrants is too high and it would not be proportionate to take that risk. Um, so this is the kind of training that can also link the uh, very professional uh, training on, on the use of force um, in, in compliance also with the fundamental rights and, and some, uh, some um, more training of fundamental rights, of course, what is a vulnerable person, what is a, a refugee, uh, what is a person in, in need of international protection. Um, the, the duty of any border guards, uh, not only Frontex uh, staff, but uh, border guards in the member states is that if a person says, uh, I need international protection. So if there is a sign, any sign that the person indicates that he or she wants to, to, to seek uh, international protection, border guards have to hand over this person to the authorities which are competent for uh, asylum. So that means in our operations, when we have the European uh, Union uh, Asylum Agency present in the field, we also have coordination, we also have uh, uh, cooperation with them. And of course, as we work under the national command of national authorities. So when we are in, in Greece or in Italy or now in Lithuania, uh, sometimes also at Stockholm airport, we, we might also have some, some border guards deployed there. So in that case, we work under the national command of the hosting member state. And, and they also have national authorities in charge of, uh, of uh, asylum. So the, the duty of any border guard in the European Union, Frontex staff or not, is to hand over a person to the asylum uh, authority if the person indicates that he or she needs uh, uh, protection. There are also um, programs. Uh, there is one that we developed, which is uh, called Vega Children. This is to help border guards to identify the victims of uh, trafficking in human beings. And there, there is perhaps an interesting combination between on the one hand, the protection of vulnerable persons. So let's say that the ethical part uh, the humanity, uh, that is the, 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 the topic of this uh, conference uh, this week. Um, and on the other hand, there is the law enforcement dimension on how to crack down the criminals that uh, exploit 
the, the, the misery and, and the situation of vulnerable people. Thank you. Time is going fast here. Uh, I need to ask you, which is one of the uh, criticisms that have been raised against Frontex is lack of transparency and accountability. And that makes me ask two things. How, how, how can you ensure that your staff does not participate in or omit to report illegal activities such as pushbacks? And the one is, I think that was last year in January, the EU Ombudsman uh, urged your agency to improve the monitoring of forced returns. And there were recommendations for you to publish on your website uh, an anonymized version of the reports of forced return uh, after each return operation. Is there something you have implemented? And how, how do you think about these issues of transparency and accountability? Well, first, in terms of uh, transparency and accountability, uh, there, are, there is also political accountability because uh, there is a European Parliament, which is uh, a parliament that uh, invites the executive director on a regular basis. Um, there is, uh, in terms of transparency, uh, the public access to documents. So this is also a, a European Union a procedure with the administrative uh, bodies. And we have published uh, well a lot of documents. So the the, the our uh, the number of requests and, and positive replies, where uh, the agency says uh, yes, we we disclose the documents, has been uh, multiplied by fifteen uh, in the last uh, let's say ten years. Now coming more specifically to your question about this uh, notion of pushbacks, I think we have to clarify. Uh, there is no definition. There is a definition of what is a uh, principle of no refoulement and the principle of no refoulement is that a person shall not be returned to a country where his or her life uh, is at risk uh, or there is a risk that this person would be then uh, sent back to another country where uh, the life of this person could be at risk so that's the, the legal definition let's say of the of the principle of no refoulement and then we hear for example that in some cases uh, there are interventions interceptions which are uh, foreseen by the legal framework of the border surveillance uh, either at, at land or uh, at sea so the, the the issue is very complex i will not enter into a technical discussion because your question is about the accountability and the transparency but i think what we did is that um, we improved the, the reporting lines so uh, there is a need to have more uh, um, more people on the ground in order to 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 be able to to identify if there are some some shortcomings in the in the reporting, in the assessment of some uh, some situations that are not completely clear from an operational perspective to know what was actually happening. Um, there is also, uh, of course, uh, now the contribution of these fundamental rights monitors that can feed uh, the, the, the this process. Uh, we have uh, reviewed uh, last year uh, the, and improved the serious incident report mechanism, which is now clear that when there is the, sus the suspicion that uh, possibly a, a fundamental rights violation has taken place, then this serious incident report is immediately uh, shared with the fundamental rights officer and in parallel to, uh, let's say, the operational uh, management of the of the operation. So, and and then it goes to the executive director and to to the the fundamental rights officer. So we have these two chains: one fundamental rights chain of, of command, if I may say, and one operational. Uh, and there is a, a whistleblowing um, policy in the agency. And now uh, we have clarified that this is not limited to. Um, finance, budget, um, this is not limited to the headquarters. This is not limited to report uh, suspicion of corruption or suspicion of harassment uh, and situations like this. But this can also be used by uh, staff in the field to report violation of fundamental rights or to report unethical action in the field. So I think we, we have increased, um, of course, um, Everything can be can be uh, improved at, at any time, and in terms of um, return and monitoring, yes, we we have uh, even contributed to increase the the number of uh, return flights which are monitored also in the in the member states because not so long time ago, even two or three years ago, 
in some of the member states of the European Union, there was no monitoring system in place. So we have contributed to, let's say, uh, align the standards to unify, harmonize the, the, the standards. Also we disregard the, the fundamental rights monitoring. In my views, um, return operations, return flights are one of the most sensitive activities because at any moment, uh, things can, can go wrong. And we really need to have professionals, uh, return officers, very professionals. And we need to have also very professional monitors. My uh, impression is that in the last uh, two or three years, we have improved the monitoring system. Soon the fundamental rights monitor will be able also to, to deploy uh, uh, the monitors of the, of the agency so that we don't have to rely only on the national monitors, but also that the fundamental rights officer will be able to deploy his own staff to monitor uh, return flights. So that's um, what I can say. Uh, thank you. We have a few minutes left, and this seems to be work in progress, of course. But with a few minutes left, I would like to address the uh, relationship between Frontex and uh, faith-based organizations and civil society. Sometimes when I listen in on conversations, I have the impression that there uh, is quite a ditch, and maybe even a growing ditch, between faith-based organizations and civil society on the one hand and agencies like Frontex on the other hand. And that that is uh, a risk for a threat to keeping our humanity to the future of all that has been good about Europe. So my question to you would be, um, from your perspective, what do you see when you look at the churches and other faith-based organizations? Do you see them as allies, as critics, or as enemies, or whatever? No, certainly not as, as enemies, for sure. Um, I think in a, in a democratic system, uh, we are uh, in, in societies where there is a freedom of religion. So that's the basic and first principle, that uh, everyone is free. I mean, in society, is free to have a religion and to, 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 to practice and to, to, to be member of a, a religion. And everyone is free uh, to declare that he or she doesn't have a religion. So, I, I mean, this is, uh, this is a fundamental freedom that uh, we have, that's my understanding, in, in the European Union. Then um, there might be some, some groups, some churches or other religious uh, groups uh, or NGOs a civil society that are moved by uh, religious principles. Um, some others are not based on religion, but they, they have also some, uh, let's say, views on, on humanity, maybe not based on, on faith, uh, uh, but uh, they are part of, uh, for example, the consultative forum. We have a consultative forum where, where uh, the Frontex consultative forum, where we have an interesting mix of organization, which are, um, well, either based on uh, or inspired, uh, at least the origin uh, inspired by religions, um, and, and some others are not inspired by, by religions, but so they promote, uh, uh, well, human dignity or um, rights of, uh, of migrants. So for me, they are, of course, um, not enemies. They can advise us. They can, uh, of course, uh, make recommendations. So this is uh, how it is in the in the system of this Frontex Consultative Forum. Of course, then we have um, different duties. Um, we have to implement uh, legal mandates, uh, which is uh, border and coast guard uh, mandates. Um, and and well, of course, uh, uh, by definition, NGOs are NGOs. They are non-governmental, so they are not bound by by uh, the policy uh, of, um, let's say, public institutions like the, the EU institutions or, or um, governments when we work uh, in, in a member state and we are under the, the tactical command of the, uh, in practice of the, of the, 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 the usually the Minister of Interior of that, uh, that uh, country. So they are not enemies. We cooperate, we exchange. Sometimes we, we disagree, but I think it's also part of uh, our European way of life, that we want to have the freedom of religion, freedom of not having a religion, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of um, disagreement, uh, without being violent. And this is how I, I understand the contribution that uh, 
discussions, debates can can uh, bring to the way of life we want to have in our societies in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And a very last question and an answer in one sentence or a half, <laughs> if that's possible. And the question is AI and Frontex with the development of artificial intelligence. What do you think? Will the use of AI in, for, in Frontex make for more humanitarian processes or for increasing dehumanization? I think um, when it comes to technologies uh, or artificial intelligence, uh, we really have to be to be careful, because that means that uh, at a certain point, the system or the technology, it might be designed to circumvent human beings. Um, and I can tell you something: while well, artificial intelligence can speed up some screening, some scanning of of database. So, for example, artificial intelligence for good purposes could contribute to the protection of citizens. For example, if there, there are too many data and, and no human brain could scan all this and artificial intelligence could find the, the right risk or the right solution within a couple of seconds, uh, what would be impossible for a human brain. Um, if the intention, if the purpose is good, that's fine but we should never disconnect the human brain because at a certain point there is also a, a decision that has to be made by a human person uh, in the system and and i think that's uh, that's where um, that's true for artificial intelligence it's true for other technologies i remember i told you that i was i've been working uh, for a couple of years in the in the ministry of defense i was uh, at that time uh, director of international and european law and we had to, to assess the legal impact in terms of armed conflict law of new technologies and new weapons. And for example, uh, a system that's not in the remit of Frontex, but this is just to, to tell you what is what my background can bring me as an example. A system, a, 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 a weapon system in the military domain that would be able, that, that nobody could stop, that would detect automatically the target and would not be able, for example, to recognize that at the place where uh, there is an order or it has been uh, planned to, 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 to bomb the place, in fact, in the last minute, they see that there is a convoy with, with uh, sick people, with, that there is a school, that there are vulnerable people, civilians. A pilot, a human actor would stop and would report, I could not carry out the mission. Because in the last minute, I could see that there is a doubt. And with this doubt, I stopped, I interrupted the mission. So that's what the human being can do. But if you have an automatic system, then it's a robot. Simply, you program the robot, and it cannot see that there is something that was not planned. So that's my, my contribution to this ethical dilemma. And I think we should focus on, on this, because this has an impact in every part of society. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Lugeri. That brings us to the end of our time together. Uh, we are at the brink of the time of the year when the Christian Lent is starting. Uh, and I want to end this session with a quote from the prophetic tradition, which we refer to many times during, especially during Lent. And uh, it's a word, a quote from the prophet of Amos, the fifth chapter, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. And with that beautiful image and compelling image, uh, I want to say thank you to you for giving us of your time for this conversation uh, and sending my uh, best wishes. And I also want to thank uh, all the participants in this uh, webinar. Thank you for being with us. And uh, remember, on Thursday at 3.30, there is the live conclusion of the Week of Neighbors. So make sure to be there, keeping our humanity live. And this, thank you and goodbye to Warsaw. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Archbishop, and thank you very much for, for the invitation. So. Uh, if at any point you, you would like to, to get in touch with us again, 
feel free. If you are in Warsaw, you can visit us. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.